So good day, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Community Central. My name is Brian Prophet with the Red Hat Open Source Program Office. Before we introduce our, our guest today, I'll do the usual housekeeping notes. For those of you who are not familiar with Prime Time, there is a great Q&A tool um, on your screen that you can use to ask questions of our guest after he's done with his presentation. Um, we will uh, ask the questions in the order of most light. So um, definitely vote on the questions that you see and get those out there and we'll get those questions set up for you. So housekeeping out of the way, without any further ado, I'm pleased to welcome to Community Central, Mark Bestafros, um, who is a software engineer from the Office of the CTO Emerging Technologies Group. Mark, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, it's good to be here. Um, I am going to share my screen real quick, but yeah, let's get started. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm going to be talking today about uh, GitOps automation with GitHub Actions, uh, the Actions automation tool, spe tool set specifically. Uh, this is something that I've been working on uh, for the past little bit, and yeah, we're going to talk about it today. Okay, and let's get started. Um, so first, I'll talk a little bit about the OctoET security team, which is a specific team that I'm on. Um, particularly, we our job is to look at uh, sort of new, very new, very fresh technologies and kind of evaluate their interest to Red Hat, um, either potentially for future Red Hat products or offerings, um, or for overall ecosystem security in the, in the case of the security team. Um, so it's a very sort of hands-on uh, job where we we we're, we do a lot of programming, a lot of engineering on on um, on new technologies and kind of engineer them to uh, potentially deliver value in the future. Um, as a result, we're kind of a small a small group of people, and we work on pretty small projects. Um, our projects kind of look like uh, we have two to six permanent contributors on on most of our projects, um, and many regular contributors. Um, so. What that means is like, you know, engineers that are on Octo security will usually be the ones who are sort of driving the project forward and doing most of the engineering work on, on these projects. And the regular contributors will be, you know, people who saw the project, maybe a talk or something and are interested, but maybe don't have the time to contribute full time. And they'll maybe deliver a pull request or something. Or maybe they'll do some, some outreach work, um, you know, like that. Um, and a lot of these projects tend to be GitHub native. They don't just code host on GitHub, but they also, they, they do pretty much everything on GitHub. They, they make use of GitHub's organizational features like issues and pull requests. Um, and they use them to basically run their entire project. Uh, they don't really work off of GitHub in any capacity. Um, and they also make heavy use of GitHub's CI infrastructure, particularly GitHub Actions in the past year, uh, now that that's become publicly available. Um, and finally, projects tend to be split um, into smaller component repositories across the GitHub organization. So, for example, the SIGSOR project that I mentioned before, that is, uh, that, that is an organization under which there are a bunch of smaller repositories that individual engineers uh, kind of work on relative to their strengths. Um, at some point last year, we kind of uh, looked at ourselves and, and said, well, we noticed that what with these projects that tend to be pretty small with limited number of maintainers and, you know, with our job being to kind of grow these projects from, you know, just, you know, us working on them to having a lot of interest, you know, potentially industry wide interest, um, things tend to scale pretty poorly. Um, what usually ends up happening, and this is not something unique to us, but what ends up happening is that the core maintainers tend to get bogged down dealing with, um, you know, incoming pull requests, managing issues, getting things organized, and making sure that, you know, things kind of run smoothly. And that's, you know, probably part of the job, I guess, but um, it does end up in a lot of overhead. And that's that's overhead that could, that engineers that really should be writing code, um, that, that's time that they spend not writing code. Not not that great. But even, even more than that, uh, that overhead can often lead to uh, sometimes, you know, work just kind of getting left behind. Um, it gets stalled or not looked at or not reviewed. And that's work that's kind of being left on the table that's not, that's not being put into, into the project. That's not great. Um, we really don't want to have that uh, happen. So at some point we ask the question, hey, is there a way we can maybe help our developers uh, automate some of this burden away? Can we kind of take some of the repetitive tasks that they have to do every day and make, make them automatic. 
Um, and of course, being from Red Hat, uh, I didn't, you know, what, what I, any good Red Hat ever do, and I looked to Prowl, which is a uh, sort of Kubernetes-based CI CD system. It's used by large projects such as Kubernetes and OpenShift. Um, and it's a really, it's a very robust system. It has a lot to offer, um, much more than, than just what we were looking for, which was just pure GitOps. It has, you know, it has lots of tools for everything you'd want with CI CD. Uh, but particularly for our interests, it did have a lot of interesting GitOps tools, like, um, like a chatbot feature where you can like write a comment on a pull request and have it assign, uh, somebody to a pull request, uh, label stuff, um, stuff like that. Um, it could also automate the request to get a project. And this is all, this is all good. This is kind of the universe of what we were looking for. Um, but we realized it wasn't quite for us. Um, it is designed to be self-hosted, uh, which is cool. That's really, that's really nice that you can self-host it. Um, but it also is not necessarily feasible for small projects like what we deal with, um, in the security group. Um, and it's also a lot of overhead to manage a Kubernetes deployment uh, if you're maybe the only engineer on the project. Um, and so th this, this solution's fine for established projects like Kubernetes, like OpenShift, but less so for bootstrapping like ones like the, one, the ones that we deal with in the security group. So uh, the next place we looked to was GitHub Actions. Um, at the time, GitHub Actions was fairly new. It reached general availability uh, early last year. Um, and there wasn't really a huge ecosystem around it, uh, but we thought maybe this could be useful. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar, GitHub Actions is GitHub's first party CI CD uh, offering. Um, you basically get compute resources that you can uh, use uh, within your repositories. Um, and it's kind of really tailored to the uh, sort of build, test, deploy workflow that um, is kind of fairly standard. What's cool is that it integrates directly with GitHub's UI. So, um, it, uh, instead of having to like, for example, go to a separate site to see the results of your test run, it'll just show up right there within your pull request. Um, it has a rich ecosystem of actions to use and build on. Um, it uses event-based workflows. So some examples, um, specifically testing, um, maybe on a, whenever a new pull request comes in, um, you might, uh, want to run cargo test in the case of a, of a Rust project. You might want to, you know, run cargo test when you commit push to a PR and then you want to run cargo format. Um, or you could just, you know, use a shell script to determine whether, you know, files have an attached to a license header. And additionally, you know, maybe when new commits are added to main, like when a pull request is merged or, or something else happened, you can build and deploy. Um, that's really what GitHub Actions is sale for. That's what a lot of, a lot of new cases are built around that. And that's what it's really good for. But we had the idea, why don't we try and build something on GitHub Actions that would allow us to sort of, sort of Automate what, um, automate what, uh, we, uh, automate our sort of, our organization, uh, our GitHub issues and pull request organization. That's really, uh, the sort of, uh, synthesis of the actions automation tool set, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, I figured I'd start by talking about the sort of ethos behind that tool set. Uh, as we kind of alluded to, the, the first thing that, that, the, the Biggest benefit we get from from actions automation is that it's low overhead. Um, these uh, the the tools that we've written here run entirely within GitHub Actions, uh, so that you don't have to really manage any deployments. Um, GitHub manages them for you, spins the VM for you when you need it, and and set it down when you're done. Um, and all the code that is written here is all completely stateless. They're just single run scripts that uh, don't need to pers persist anything between runs, um, and they they do the job and and then they're done. Which is really nice. That's low overhead. They're very, it's fairly easy to set up. And once it's set up, it will just keep working, which is cool. And we also want it to be light touch, uh, which is to say, uh, it should focus on making GitHub's existing organizational structures much more useful and proactive. Um, we don't want you to change how you use GitHub. We want you to, uh, just use it more proactively or, or more, make it more useful, make GitHub more useful for the way you already use it. Um, to that end, I find it helpful to, uh, define work in GitHub terms using the two primitives of issues and progress. And I kind of see issues as work that needs to be planned, if implemented or otherwise completed. It's like, it's like, you know, just a, basically just a text document saying, this is a task we'd like to do or something we, we plan on doing or something we would like to do. Um, but it's really not a commitment necessarily. It's just an idea. Um, so, and on the flip side, um, you have pull requests. Pull requests are completed, concrete completed work, or close to it work, uh, that needs to be reviewed for acceptance into a repository. This is 
work that is basically done and uh, is more or less ready to go. It just needs to be looked at. And you can kind of think of these as two bookends of the same of the same thing, where issues are the beginning of a task and they represent an idea. Pull request represents the completion of that task, more or less. Um, given that, let's take a look closer look at pull requests. Um, given given kind of what we said before, that pull requests are work that's already done, we should it's probably a good assumption to have that pull requests are always important. Uh, they co they contain work that's already done, and pushing that across the finish line should pretty much for every repository to be a priority. Um, at least that's, the, that's the assumption that we're working on. And uh, just for the sake of completeness, um, a typical GitHub PR workflow might look like um, you have a PR submitted by an author, um, and then once that PR comes in, it's reviewed by a maintainer. They'll come along either give a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, if it's th a thumbs down, it might be like, hey, this looks good, but um, here are some changes you might want to implement. Um, and that would take the form of a change request or review. Um, when that happens, the author would then address them and send it back to the maintainer to review. And that cycle just continues uh, until the maintainer thinks it looks good and they give a thumbs up. And once that happens, then pending other things, maybe like tests passing, the pull request gets merged. And this is, can be kind of encapsulated by this, by this small little diagram here. Um, the PR comes in, it's reviewed by a maintainer, and then edited by author, and that just uh, so it kind of continues until eventually the maintainer sends it to be approved and then merged. Fairly straightforward. Now, how do we make sure that this process doesn't stall? Um, one thing that we've noticed is that within this cycle between being reviewed and be and the author addressing those those reviews, that tends to be where things get stalled. Um, either the reviewer will submit a review and the author uh, will sort of Straggle in in getting it uh, in addressing it, or the or the author will submit a, a, a patch, and the maintainer won't have time to to address it or, or something along those lines. And that is kind of where we can dig into the shortcomings of the pull request. Um, in particular, it can be very unclear who is immediately responsible for pushing a PR towards completion. Um, and in particular. Um, the assignee field of a pull request is not really super useful in, in our experience. Um, it doesn't mean the same thing everywhere, and it can mean different things in lots of places. Um, so, for example, in some repositories, maybe the assignee is just a maintainer. They're, they're the point person for that, for that pull request, and they're the one who's responsible for, for getting it across the finish line. That makes some sense, but it also isn't perfect. Um, Maybe the maintainer has given a review and is waiting for feedback, but the author is not. Uh, it doesn't have time to to get it done. Other other repositories might have the author be be the assignee or or vice versa. There there are different models for doing this. Um, but the end result is that uh, the assi being assigned to a PR doesn't really carry much meaning. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's your responsibility when when it doesn't necessarily mean that it's your responsibility when you're assigned to it. And that's that. This specific problem is what the pull request responsibility tool, which is one of the tools within the actions automation tool set, that's specifically what this is designed to solve. Particularly, uh, the goal is to make pull request and metadata more useful. The way it does that is with a few different uh, actions that it does. Um, um, some of them, some of them are, uh, for example, it can randomly request a set of reviewers for an organization team in GitHub's just reviewers. So it'll just randomly assign a set of people based on you know a number of people to, to request. It can copy labels from linked issues, uh, like we kind of mentioned before. Um, pull requests are kind of the end of an issue, and, the is and, and pull requests are sort of the end of an issue. An issue, on GitHub, you can actually link issues to pull requests. You can say, like, this pull request resolved issue number 345. Um, and what that, what that action will do is that it will look at the issue, you'll see if it's labeled as anything, and then it'll move some of those labels over to the pull request um, just for organization's sake. That can also automatically merge uh, pull requests when the GitHub merge status, that is, uh, you know, whether it, it has a review by a, by a review with write access or that's configurable within GitHub, whether whether that's um, accepted or not. All these things um, are have, have been done in different places, um, but what uh, what's particularly cool about this action and what I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into um, is that this there's also an action to automatically adjust PR assignees based on who is most responsible at any given time. And so let's take a look at this. Um, going back to that typical PR workflow we mentioned, um, 
how can we assign responsibility based on, on this flow? Um, how can we kind of extract uh, responsibility? We can actually extract two critical events. There is why a reviewer submits a review requesting changes. Well, that's a pretty clear indicator that the reviewer is thinks, thinks that there, there are changes that need to be made. And that's an indicator that the author should be responsible. The author is responsible for addressing that review. Um, additionally, that the reviewer is no longer responsible because they have submitted their, their review. Additionally, on the other side of that, when the author requests a re-review, they have uh, indicated that they think they have they've addressed whatever feedback was given, and that they should have a, that the reviewer should have another one. And so that's a pretty clear indicator that the author should no longer be responsible, and that the reviewer should be responsible. So that's that's what we should do. And then we can kind of flesh out that sort of small diagram into something that's much more robust. Um, when we have a new PR that comes in, we have a set of reviewers that are requested. And then at this point, the reviewer is assigned. A, a reviewer, it could be multiple reviewers, but like in this case, we're dealing with just one reviewer. A reviewer is assigned to the pull request. And it's now their responsibility to submit a review. Um, additionally, we do account for the fact that you don't have to be uh, assigned to a pull request in order to submit a review. The, you could submit a review just as somebody who is looking at a pull request and decides to leave the review. Anyway, if if you did, if, if uh, you know either way, if a review is submitted and it's a changes request review, it it's become reviewed, and at that point, we now have the indicator that the review should be unassigned and the author should be assigned. At this point, we now have an indicator that the author is responsible. They are they are the ones who are responsible for writing a patch to address that review. Once they request review, review, then the author can be unassigned and the reviewer can be assigned again. And again, now we have clear responsibility. Um, and this cycle can continue again until it's approved in March. Um, and to, a good way to illustrate this is with a timeline. So let's say we have a pull request submitted by uh, Alice and Bob is her reviewer. So at this point, at the beginning of, uh, at the beginning of this process, Alice has submitted her PR. Bob is responsible for submitting a review on Alice's PR. Once he does that, uh, now Alice is responsible. Uh, and Bob is no longer responsible because he has done his job of submitting the review. Then Alice submits a patch for Bob's feedback. Well, at this point, Alice is still responsible because she hasn't actually she hasn't explicitly requested Bob's re-review yet. But once she does, then that's an indicator that Bob is responsible and Alice is not. Um, and when Bob approves the request, then Bob is no longer responsible. The nice thing about this uh, action and the crucial innovation is that this now gives uh, assignments on pull requests a lot more meaning. They now indicate immediate responsibility. They are an indicator that the assignee specifically, that person is the one person who needs to take action to move that pull request forward. And that makes it a lot more useful. Instead of it just being something that you know, will accumulate and you'll, you'll get assigned to many, many things that you know some of them aren't quite what you need to be doing, you now know that assign, being assigned to something means you have something to do there, which is really good. Um, and actually, I would like to show you an example run. So this is an example of, uh, this is just a small, simple example repository. All it has is a readme. Um, and I have submitted a pull request to it. And actions audit, the actions audit control set is running on here. Um, you can see uh, that I've actually linked it to an issue. Um, I have an issue to flush out the readme. It's got a few labels on here. And I've said, I've said that this pull request resolves issue number five. You can see that, that the actions automation tool has actually done a few things here. Um, it has copied over the documentation label. It didn't copy over the good first issue and help wanted labels because those are more pertinent to issues and not pull requests. Um, so I copied over that label. That's the copy uh, linked labels uh, action. And then it automatically requests review from uh, Lily, who's my colleague from the Octo security team and uh, who has graciously agreed to help me uh, with this little demo thing. Um, and yeah, so she was requested. You can see that she's up here. And then you can see that the the uh, actions object tool set assigned her. Uh, it, 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 she's not assigned right now, but as a few hours ago, she was assigned. And she knew that it was her responsibility to leave a review. And she did. She said that it looks good, but could use more references to Neon Cat. Okay, well, so I did that. I made a patch that uh, added some more references to Neon Cat. Um, in doing so, um, but once once I had once this review was submitted, crucially, um, 
the actions automation bot um, assigned me and unassigned her because she had submitted a change of request to review. I then submitted a patch adding more references to Neon Cat, um, and then I requested a review from her. And what that did, you can see, is that it assigned her because she is now responsible for uh, giving me more feedback and unassigned me because I had given I had given my patch. I had said so that I added more cats. How about now? And then she said, submitted one more review, one more review saying that I think it needs just one more cat. Um, and we can see that actions the actions automation bot um, assigned me and unassigned Lily. Um, Mark? And yes. Actually, sorry to interrupt, but uh, we're getting some requests. Can you possibly zoom your font set a little bit on the browser? It's a hard, a, a difficult to read on the screen. All right. How about no now? problem. Thanks. Cool. Um, yeah. So this is. I'll just show it. It shows for people that uh, that missed this. Um, you can see the the sort of timeline of actions here. Um, actions automation is taking actions here. They, it's it's add the label, it's a uh, request to review, and then it, it continuously assigns and unassigns people based on who is responsible. Um, and just to wrap up, um, Lily suggested that I add one more cat, and that's exactly what I did. You can see here, I have a lot of neon cats. So at this point, I have submitted a patch, and this, I, I've submitted the patch, and I believe it's ready to be re-reviewed by Lily. So, what do I do? I actually go up here. Uh, Lily is a reviewer, and I can actually request a re-review from her. I'm going to click that, and now it's indicated that she is uh, it's a waiting request to review. But I'm still responsible. I'm, I'm still listed as assigned. But um, if it runs, and hopefully it will, did you can see now that I, I requested a review from Lily. It might take about a minute to run, but once it does it, we should see that the actions automation bot will unassign me and reassign Lily. Hopefully that should come. This is that's more or less what this what this looks like. And yeah, I might um back here. Yeah, so it is running. And there we go. Exactly, exactly what we expected. Um, actions automation, assign Lily and unassign me. Which is exactly what we want. So now it's an indication that Lily needs to, uh, is responsible and she's responsible for looking at my changes and figuring out whether it, uh, what, whether it's good or, or not. So let's, uh, go back to the presentation and, um, And uh, let's talk a little bit about how it actually works. Um, so the actions automation workflow, uh, the, the actions automation uh, tool set subscribes to several GitHub events. So um, it will listen for the pull request event, the issue event, and the schedule event. Um, and each one of these, you know, obviously uh, they, they 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 trigger when different events on GitHub happen. And then when one of these events happens, Actions will provision a compute resource and then run um, several uh, Python scripts that contain the logic for Actions automation. Each one of these scripts will uh, filter out events that won't act on, uh, particularly, uh, for example, maybe uh, the pull request responsibility, uh, the pull request responsibility uh, tool might not care about issue events, for example. Um, and then once it's kind of once it's filtered those out and knows acting on an event that it should be acting on, it will perform their job, which usually takes the form of reading some data from the GitHub API, um, processing that data to determine what action it should take, and then writing to GitHub. In the case of the pull request responsibility action, um, one way this might work is maybe we listen for new review events and review request events. Um, and then on when a new review event happens, determine if that was a changes requested review. If yes, then assign the PR author. On a review requested event, then well, that's an, that's again the author requesting that uh, the uh, reviewer re-review. When that happens, reassign the requested reviewer. That seems reasonable, right? Turns out this doesn't quite work. Um, and in order to understand why, we need to talk a little bit about authenticating with GitHub. 
So let's talk a bit about the, about the GitHub API. Currently, there are two support APIs, uh, the V3 REST API and the V4 GraphQL API. Um, both support rewrite to the GitHub API. They're both perfectly functional. Um, the GraphQL API has a few extra functions. Um, in fact, the, the, the actions automation tool set is built upon GraphQL. Um, but they're both perfectly, perfectly functional. In either case, you do need an authentication token to do anything with the GitHub API. There are a few ways to get this. Um, one way is by provisioning a personal access token. This is something that you, uh, as a GitHub account, can manually provision within your settings. Um, and it's, it's just a key that you can then provide to the GitHub API and, and do stuff with. Uh, it's valid until disabled. So you, uh, once, once it's provisioned, it's basically just valid forever if you don't, if you don't disable it. And it's user configurable in terms of its scope. So it can, it can have access to your entire account or none of it. And the way this would work is if you take an, an API action using a personal access token that you provision, um, the, the way it appears on GitHub is that, um, but like let's say I have a script that merges a pull request um, and it uses a personal access token that I provisioned. Uh, what that would look like on GitHub, it would say that I am the one who merged that pull request. It's as if I'm like, it's a, pull, a personal access token basically allows you to write a script that takes actions on GitHub on your behalf. Um, so that's one way. And the other way is the GitHub token. And this is a token that is specific to GitHub Actions, and it's automatically provided for provision for each GitHub Actions run. Um, it's valid for 60 minutes, um, and it's aggressively scoped. So uh, what that means is that basically it's a key that you can only use for the single run that, uh, that it was, that was provisioned for, which is a nice property. Um, but digging a little bit further, um, turns out the GitHub token actually receives different read or write permissions depending on the event that created it. Um, if you use on, on, on pull request related events, it turns out it's read only. Whereas with most others, it's read write. Um, and it turns out there's actually a very good reason for this. It's because write trust tokens on untrusted PRs are a very big security risk. Um, and the reason why is actually, uh, fair, it, it makes some sense. Um, it's a fairly sort of common expectation of CI CD systems that, uh, that, uh, forks and pull requests can actually modify, uh, tests. Um, so in this case, PRs from forked repositories, if somebody forks your repository and then makes a pull request, they can actually modify your workflows. That effectively means that you are allowing, uh, you're allowing them to run untrusted code on your actions instances. Um, this is fine in a case of somebody who's just changing a test and wants to see that test run as part of their pull request. But if you're doing uh, GitHub action, if you're if you're doing GitHub API actions, and you are using a write token with that, that's a very bad idea because that's untrusted code, and you're basically giving it a write token that can modify your repository. That's that's a recipe for disaster. Um, as a result, GitHub restricts write tokens based on GitHub restricts write tokens and sensitive repository secrets um, on pull request events. Um, so what that effectively means is that uh, it's really hard to uh, use pull request events for the kind of work that we're looking for. GitHub is continuously introducing new safety features around these these uh, around this sort of exact issue. Uh, for example, a few weeks ago they introduced a feature where um, if a pull request is coming in from a new contributor, somebody who's never contributed to that repository before. Um, there's not now an option to manually approve the workflow. Um, the, the, a maintainer has to manually approve workflows from running before they do, which is a nice feature. So it doesn't help us. Um, for the purposes of, of our, of our action, PR events will work, but others will. So another alternative we can do is just state things. We run on a timer and then every 15 minutes or so, parse the full timeline of events on a given PR. Uh, so this would include like when the pull request is submitted, uh, any review requests that happened, any reviews that were submitted, whether they were changed requested or not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then based on that history, we can then separate uh, a history of events for each reviewer out and then uh, determine using that history for individual reviewers, determine whether each reviewer or the author is responsible based on that history. And then given that list of responsible review, take that and assign. And that's it. That's, that's, it. that's back to exactly how the pull, the pull request responsibility um, action works. Or rather, the specific you know assignment assignment logic how that works. And uh, actually, before we do this, let's have a look here and have a look at uh, Lily has approved these changes. 
And in fact, uh, Actions has done its job as well. It unassigned Lily because she approved her changes. Fantastic. That is that is very, very handy. Okay, so this sounds really cool. How can I use it? Well, that's my, what you might be asking at this point. It turns out it's actually available to the public. Um, it's usable on any GitHub repository that has Actions enabled. Um, and there's a quick start guide in the repository. Um, it should be fairly easy to set up. At the moment, you do need a personal access token, although coming very soon is interoperability with uh, the GitHub token, which should mean that it should be as simple as literally just including one workflow, and then you get all these nice benefits automatically. And that's all I have. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Mark. Um, so we have a number of questions, so let's get right to it. So Dewan asks, which GitHub plan did your team use? Did you find the free plan sufficient for the number of runners and build minutes that you get? We did use a free plan and it was perfectly sufficient. Um, we never really ran into any rate limiting in terms of the, in terms of actions itself. Um, in the process of developing this, we certainly did run, run into the GitHub API rate limit, um, several times, but, um, yeah, the, the action, for actions itself, it seems like it's, it's fine for us. It remains to be seen how it would scale to a larger repository. That's something I definitely am interested in, in, looking at um, if we do manage to deploy it on a um, larger repository. Worth noting that at this point, it is deployed on mostly small projects, um, but it's worked pretty well for them. Uh, people have, have been very happy with the, the usability improvements. Okay, great. So the next question comes from Kyle. Curious as to how uh, these GitHub Actions, this GitHub Actions integration plays with Tekton. Does it play uh, play hand in hand, or does it take over the Tekton CI CD pipelines? Uh, great question. I don't have a great answer to. Um, I honestly have not had a huge amount of interaction with Tekton, although I am very interested in doing so. Um, it's something I'm, I'm interested in, in in looking at in the near future. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have a clear answer. But at this point, it's really uh, mostly restricted to uh, GitOps. The this tooling is mostly restricted to just you know doing cool stuff with GitHub, basically. Um, which is not to say that it, that's what it's all that's limited, limited to. I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunity for just cool GitHub actions generally. That tends to be where my work is heading. Um, and I'm, I tend to be doing a lot of sort of action-related work in, in different areas. Okay, great. So Carson has a question um, and a compliment. He says, this is brilliant. Thanks for showing us. And then the question is, from a vendor lock-in perspective, what have you been able to plan for a project wanting to migrate uh, to something like GitHub, GitLab? Is there anything yeah. transferable? Um, so, very good question and very valid. Um, vendor lock-in is not what we want. Um, for now, uh, this is this is not. We haven't really considered GitLab, uh, although the the logic of effectively what we're doing is we are running. We're just running a script that. Um, interacts with the GitHub API. So in this case, it would be a, it would just be a matter of sort of translating the logic uh, and maybe changing how it interacts with the GitLab API instead of the GitHub API. Um, so I don't think it would, it's certainly something that would be interesting. It's not something that I have looked at uh, yet. Okay. Uh, so Dewan has another question. Could you please discuss the choice of writing a container-based action versus a JavaScript-based action? Also, could you please go over the CI workflow YAML for the steps? Sure. Yeah, I could do that. Um, so this is actually neither uh, container or JS-based. This is just this is just pure shell. Um, it's just uh, yeah, it's it just runs uh, it runs shell scripts that are that uh, are Python, so it just it just runs Python basically, um, but it doesn't it doesn't provision a container or anything. Um, and yeah, so this is this is not JavaScript and it's not a container either. Um, and I'd be happy to go over the workflow. Um, I probably need to share my screen again. Give me one sec here. Let me let me actually pull up the let me pull up the pull request responsibility action. Yeah, let me share my screen again. So uh, this is the pull request responsibility repository. Um, you can see here the uh, aforementioned readme and the 
uh, quick start guide. Um, there are two. Uh, there are two YAMLs that we can look at. Uh, one I think you're most interested in um, is this one, which is the definition of how the action actually works. So one thing, so what we do here is uh, we have a few inputs. Um, in this case, there are four different scripts we can run. Uh, assign, copy labels linked, merge, and request. The assign action is what I spent the majority of this talk talking about. Um, but each one of these have, have a bunch of, so each one of these is, is more or less optional. So you can, uh, you can say, I will only want to run, you know, assign and merge, right? I only want to run assign and request. And you can have that be an input. Um, reviewers and num to request, these are specific to the request. Um, so to the request script here, which is what automatically requests people on your pull requests. Um, num to request is just like it will request this many people. So like if you have, let's say, 10 reviewers in your reviews team, then if you say three, then we'll pick three randomly from that group. Um, the reviewers, this string is basically the string that corresponds to the team in the parent organization that is the set of review reviewers. So in this case, there are just two people, but in a larger cluster, it could be many more. And this, to answer your question, this is actually a composite one, which is basically just a shell. Um, what we do here is we install one dependency. This is actually a, a, a uh, this is a library that I wrote to interact with GitHub's GraphQL um, API. Uh, and I could talk a bit more of that if people are interested, um, but it installs that and then it basically just runs each of these scripts. Um, and it will only run it if uh, it was included in the action, this actions input. Um, so whether, if, if the repository had opted into it. And then it runs each of these scripts. And each one of these scripts, some of them have inputs, some of them don't. And then um, we also have some debug information at the end. Um, and then there's another YAML here, which is the, um, this is what you actually have to include to run it. Um, you can see that it just runs on a bunch of different types of events. Not all of these are strictly necessary, but it's nice to have them, um, just so you don't miss any. Um, and you can see here that it's fairly simple to, to define. You have a pull request responsibility job that runs on Ubuntu. You have to give it, um, it you have to give it your personal access token as a repository secret. Um, and then uh, it will use this repository, actions automation slash pull request responsibility at name. And then you give it this set of actions you want to run, the reviews team, and the number to request. And then it'll work. Okay. Any other questions? I'm happy to answer. We do. Yeah, we have a couple more. So Patrick uh, Patrick says, really good stuff. Can GitHub Actions interact or integrate with ZenHub? I am sure can. I have not really looked into that. I will mention that ZenHub is something we looked at, but we that kind of ran into the sort of that problem, like the decision we wanted to make, where we didn't want to go off of GitHub. ZenHub is really something that builds on top of GitHub and like is a separate platform that you interact with. We wanted to keep using GitHub, but make GitHub more useful. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of that's more or less what it is. Um, but yes, yeah, so there's certain. I'm sure there's an opportunity to interact with it. Um, this tool set in particular, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, next question is from Joe, who asks, isn't it possible to use a GitHub webhook to have the event fire on uh, pull request events versus using actions? Then the receiver service can use the API to update ownership, appropri ownership appropriately. Yes, that is certainly possible. Um, that, re that requires having a server running, though. We don't want that. We want this to be something that is stateless. Um, if you have if you have a webhook, then you need that, that, that webhook needs to go somewhere and it needs to be on a server that's listening. The nice thing about this is that you don't need to have any of that. You don't need to manage any server or anything like that. Um, this is something that you just that's you, you just put it in and then GitHub spins it up on demand. Um, so yes, that would work, and it is certainly a model that could work, but um, yeah, that's that's basically why we didn't choose to go that route. We actually did look at GitHub uh, webhook. That we decided to make that decision uh, based on on that. Yeah. 
Okay. And we have one more question from Karsten, who um, wanted to confirm that the uh, the web address for this is github.com slash actions dash automation. Yes. Yep. Okay. That is correct. And then, he, is, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, that is, that's the URL for the, or, the parent organization, which has a bunch of, like, sub tools that do different things. Mm -hmm. um, Specific, like for example, if I'm I'm sharing my screen, this is the actions automation uh, organization, and there's a pull request responsibility repository, which is what I talked about today. We also have a triage action, a manage your labels action, um, like your issues test, and then um, the GitHub GQL library that I talked about. Um, so yeah, it, that's that's where if you want to learn about the entire sort of thing there, that's uh, the, the entire set of tools. That's where you can find it. Uh, Pull request responsibility in particular is what I talked about today. Um, I, I am reading your question. Um, I, I, this is, this is at this point more of a side project for me. It was something I worked on more at the end of last year and I'm working on other sort of actions related work now. Um, but I would love, uh, both contributions and users. Um, I'm, I'm open to any kind of, uh, interest. I, I love, I love working on this and it's something I gladly contribute more to. Okay. Yeah, and just to follow up with Mark, for those of you who can't see this in the recording, the, the additional question was, is Mark looking for uh, additional uh, participation and contributors? So, yeah, yeah, thank you for answering that for us. Yeah. Um, with that, we have gone through the questions from our audience today, so I think we're cool. going to wrap this uh, session up. Mark, thank you so much for coming on today and walking us through this uh, automated automation tool set. Um, it's definitely uh, been educational for me, so I, I hope it's been yeah. educational for everybody else. I hope so too. I really enjoyed uh, presenting. Thank you. All right. Thank you again. So with that, we'll wrap up this edition of Community Central. Stay tuned for uh, additional episodes uh, of our video cast. Tune in to communitycentral.tv and look ahead at our schedule that's coming up. Until then, be safe and have a great day.